Welcome back, everybody. This is Pseudonymous BN, and we are about to jump into another Wings 3D tutorial. So if you watched the last one, you probably already know what the deal is with this one. We're about to start exploring the wild and wonderful world of UV mapping, which is the process of applying textures to all the beautiful stages that you created. Hopefully you kept them aligned to the grid while you were modeling them. Hopefully that's stuck in that last lesson of ours, because that's going to make the difference between whether these will look legit, whether these will look professional, whether they're going to have that level of polish that I think is necessary these days to make your stages stand out. So what we're going to do is we're going to start exploring 3D UV mapping with these sort of widgets that we've created here. and. If you missed the last video, just do yourself a favor and go back and watch it, because I'm not going to talk about any kind of modeling techniques here. I'm just going to jump straight to the texturing parts. If you want to know how I created these shapes, you just got to watch the last video. It's texturing we're going to be getting into today. So what I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to hide all of these from the world, and I'm actually going to go up to Merge from File here and just merge an older stage of mine that I created earlier because this stage has all the textures that I'm about to use for all the UV mapping that we're going to do. The only reason I imported this was just to get the textures and the materials all just ready to go instantly. So what I recommend you might uh, want to do is maybe make a stage or a 3D model rather, a, just a wings file that has all of the textures that you want to use already applied to just standard cubes. That way you could just import that and not have to worry about making any materials, anything like that. But let's say we did want to make a material. Maybe I'll just go through that real quick. So we're gonna separate this up so we can work with these pieces one at a time. What I'm gonna do here is, if you right click once you've selected something, it can be in face mode, body mode. I usually just do it in body mode because I wanna UV map the entire object. You get on here to UV mapping and left clicking or right clicking this does make a difference. Usually when you don't have a UV map already, it's fine to just left click. But if you want to make sure you give it a new UV map, like if you have a texture on it already and you just want to give it something new instead, you would right click that. But we're just going to left click it for now because this is our first time UV mapping this unmapped object. So that pulls up this window. This is your UV mapping segmenting window. Usually what it's fine to do is just select all. I just hit control A to do that. Then you right click and you can go to segment by. Now what you want to pick here in this segment by menu is projection most times. And that's going to create these colors all over this object. That's kind of telling the program how it's going to cut up the faces when it comes time to actually uh, set them aside and texture them all. So we're going to select all again, and we're going to go to continue now. And projection normal is usually what you're going to want to pick. We're going to go over projection camera too, because that's definitely something else you're going to want to use from time to time. But for now, since we're not really worrying about being too specific about anything, we're going to stick with projection normal. Now this pulls up a new window, and we're going to dock it here to the side of our 3D modeling window. This is the UV mapping window. Actually, the reason it's called UV mapping is because U and V are the axes in this sort of two-dimensional world that the textures live in. And I don't know which is which, I can't tell you that, but uh, that's just the reason it has that name. A little bit of trivia to help you out your next trivia night at the local pub and grub. So uh, let's go ahead and just get into UV mapping. You may have noticed that this is cube 1 sep 11, that's what it is in the menu, but you may have noticed that a new material was created when we did this up in our materials tab, cube 1 sep 11 AUV. That is our new material that we just created, and it doesn't have a texture in it yet, so it just gets this standard alphabet soup texture, which is just hideous to behold. But if you go down here to images, you can actually see that we have images loaded into this file. And just for the sake of it, I'm going to import an image. So let's go to some place where we might have an image that we could import. How about these purple checks that I actually retextured from a bubbly washing machine texture from the vanilla game? So once you've imported an image from that menu, you can just click it, drag it up to your new material that you just created by making that new UV map, 
and then you can drop that onto that material cube and it's going to pull up this menu. It tells you which way you want this texture to be. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there is no reason to pick anything other than base color for the purpose of Super Monkey Ball. You're not going to need any of that. So we're picking base color and now this material is loaded in. We just made a new material. So we can actually right click that, rename it. We can call it something different. Uh, we called the last block Fred. So how about we call this material Harold. All right, Harold, you are now a material. So uh, we're not actually gonna be using this, so bye-bye, Harold. But that gives you the idea of what you wanna do if you want to make materials yourself. And you're gonna have to do that to start out with but if you go through that process with every image texture that you're going to be using in this UV mapping process, that's going to be uh, an instant, easy way to just get every material into your project. Just make a new wings file, put them all on cubes, don't bother modeling or doing anything fancy because you're just going to delete them as soon as you import them. Just go to this file, merge, then pick what you want to import, the file that you created with all those textures, and then they're all there for you to work with. So you can see here we have a bunch of images loaded, and I'm just going to show you what some of them are. This is a tech, this is a checker texture that I have in here, and I think, let me find the right one here. This one is going to be our fill texture. So I'm going to go into the process of how I texture a stage once I've modeled it. I'm just going to take you step by step. I'm going to texture all these widgets, and I'm going to show you how to get the checkers to actually be scaled correctly and positioned correctly, which is difficult, but stick with me. I'll show you how to do it right. So let's just start with this simple square. Easiest thing to texture out of anything you could ever imagine. So we're going to go to this UV mapping menu again. We're going to select all. We can't even see it, but we have selected the entire thing because I hit Control A. Segment by projection. Standard stuff. Continue. Projection normal. It just unwraps this and it actually created a new material. But we're not going to need that new material. So we're just going to right click in this 3D world here. And we're going to go down to... Actually, it's not here on the menu because you have to be in face mode if you want to choose the material. So keep that in mind. Make sure you're in face mode if you want to set the material. So here it is on our menu now, material. We're going to click that and we're going to choose dark wall too because that's my fill texture. I just went ahead and put the fill texture over this entire platform. Now what I usually do once I've textured something is, uh, well for starters, I just texture the entire thing with fill texture. And once I've done that, I go to scale with everything selected. I'm going to pick max uniform and then I'm going to pick scale, normalize sizes. Now what that did is it just gives you a nice uniform spread of this texture. It's all going to be scaled the same way. I think that looks a little too big, so I'm actually going to scale this a little bit, just uniform, uh, about a 200% scale. Looks decent to me. Now that's the easy part, doing this fill texture, and that'll cover a lot of areas in your stage, but when it comes time for details, then you got to get into some more nitty gritty uh, technical stuff. So before we get to checkers, I'm just going to show you that usually when I have a small platform like this, I'm going to put a trim texture on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scale this max vertical. When you're getting a trim texture on, you just want this to be max vertical, and I'll show you why in a second. I'm going to set the material to my trim, this one here. And because I set it to max vertical, it's just going from bottom to top all the way. Nice trim texture along the edges here. I'm going to set this to max horizontal too. Now you can see this is a bit stretched out. It doesn't look quite right. So I'm just going to scale it a little bit on the horizontal until it can look decent, I think. Uh, I usually don't mind eyeballing this kind of stuff with a trim texture because I don't think it needs to perfectly align. Maybe you want it to perfectly align. In that case, you're going to need to crunch some numbers, like I'm about to show you how to do for checkers. So on to the part you've all been waiting for, checkers. We're going to go ahead and set this top face to a checker texture. And you can see this already looks kind of decent, but these checkers, as good as they look, they're not scaled correctly. The game, uh, basically, you want 
two checkers, or rather four checkers, just two by two squared, to occupy each square meter that Wings defines here. Just one of these grid squares needs to have four checkers inside of it. No matter what the shape is, that's your rule of thumb. And I'm going to show you how you get that. So the first thing you need to do is measure up this platform. This one's a perfect square, so you barely have to do much at all to get that measurement. You can go to your edge mode here and just click one of these edges along the side here. And up in your top left corner, Wings will actually tell you the length. So we've just measured this to be six meters long. And since this is a perfect square, every single one of these edges is going to be the same length, six meters long. Now that's important to know. Just keep that number in mind because we're going to use that number to scale the checkers correctly. Let me dock this UV mapping window so we can get ready. Now the first thing you want to do when you have a surface with checkers is you want to right click, you go to scale and max uniform. Now because this is a square, it fills this one cell, the one that has the alphabet soup on it, perfectly. If it were a different shape, there's other things we have to do. What you have to do in all circumstances is just scale it max horizontal and max vertical so that even if it's like, I don't know, the shape of a duck, something super complex, it fills this entire square. Even if it looks deformed in this state, that's how you want it to be because you're going to use some numbers to scale it correctly right after you do this. You just have to start with it occupying one square completely. And I'll show you how to do this with some more complex shapes so you see what I mean. Now the next thing you're gonna do is, remember that number six? Now we're gonna take that number six and we're actually gonna divide that by half in our heads. So half of six, of course, is three, as we remember from our kindergarten math lessons. So what we're gonna do is scale uniform, and we're gonna hit the tab button. So this is gonna be three multiplied by 100, because you have to multiply all these measurements by 100 to do these scaling factors. We're gonna scale this uniform by 300%. Because it's a square, we have the luxury of scaling uniform this time, but eventually we're not going to have to. And the reason I divided that number by half in my head, like why is it not 600? Let me just put 600 first to show you what happens if we get that. Look how tiny those are. We're actually putting 4 in every square instead of 2 in every square. And the reason for that is, let me find a checkered texture here. These checker textures are actually 4 checkers per square texture. And uh, in game, we actually have to do half of that. I know it's so confusing, but the standard way a texture is usually set up, like all the vanilla ones from Super Monkey Ball, they're four by four checkers. But every square in this 3D modeling program needs to have two by two checkers. So that's why we have to scale it by half. If you have a texture that's just two by two checkers, you wouldn't have to scale it by half you could just scale it as the measurement is. So we would scale it 600 if the texture only had, I don't know, four checkers in it. Or maybe you have a texture that has twice as many checkers as mine has. Then you'd have to do a completely different process, but you can use your noggin for that one. I'm not gonna take you all for fools. I'll let you figure that out. But just know that depending on what your texture is, it's gonna be different every time. So what we're gonna do now is scale uniform tab to get that numeric input and we're going to scale this by 300. This is the correct scaling. Now we're finished because this platform is a basic square, easiest thing to do correctly. All of these checkers are scaled correctly and positioned correctly. But for other shapes it gets a little bit more complicated. What if we wanted to do this one? So let me just take everything else. I'm going to combine this just for the purpose of hiding it. We're going to scale checkers correctly on this ridiculous shape. So same set of steps. First, we're just applying the fill texture, projection normal, scale max uniform, and normalize the sizes. We're going to go ahead and scale that a little bit just for the sake of making it look good. And we're going to use this dark texture, the fill. So next thing we're going to do is apply the trim, same as it ever was. 
we're going to get our X view here, just pressing that X key because we're in orthogonal. This makes it super easy. This is one of the situations where you're going to be most grateful for those instant key presses to get those axis views. Now we're going to just marquee along this, and this is going to select all of our edges along this entire shape. We selected 39 faces in one fell swoop just by doing that. Now we can change the material to our trim. We're going to go back to the UV mapping window. And because this is all like a bunch of shapes of various sizes, like it just cut them up as it did, um, you can't just go ahead and scale max vertical because usually that just distorts it. What I usually do is I scale it just a little bit uniform, eyeballing it until it's just about vertical like this. Then I correct it by scale max vertical, which you have to be in body mode to do, by the way. Now all the trim should be looking nice. Although it looks a little bit squeezed thin, if you ask me, just because of this texture. This is like a texture that's wider than it is tall, I believe. Let me check that real quick. Yeah, that's the shape of this texture. So we have to compensate for that a little bit by scaling this a little bit thinner horizontally. That looks better. Now it's time for the checkers. Now don't be intimidated by what I'm about to show you because once you learn how to do it well enough, you're gonna learn how to do this just at the drop of a hat. It's gonna be second nature to you. What we're about to do is measure this object and you could do this just manually by counting the number of squares, just like one, two, three, four, but we don't wanna feel like the count from Sesame Street here, do we? Just counting a bunch of rice? Like that gets to be ridiculous if you have a huge amount of squares to count. You don't wanna end up doing that. Thankfully, wings can help you. Now we don't have any edge that we can measure the entire width and length of this object with in the case of this ridiculously shaped blob. There's no simple way to do it like we did with our square before. But if we go to vertex selection mode, we can select different vertices. Now I found two vertices. One is here on the furthest right end of the object. The other is over here on the furthest left end. There's no other vert vertex that goes any further out left or any further out right than the two I selected. Now if you look up to the top of the screen here, up in the top left, look at these numbers in brackets. That's actually the X, Y, and Z distance between those two vertexes, vertices, that's the proper plural, that we selected here. So the X distance, which is what we're looking for, is going to be listed first. It's 10. This is 10 squares across. We're going to use the same process to find the Z distance. So we're going to pick this vertex because it's the furthest to the top, and this one because it's one of the furthest to the bottom. You could also pick this one just for shits and giggles, but I'm going to pick that one. So you notice here, we're looking at the Z measurement this time. It's 11 meters lengthwise. So you can always just look at these measurements and figure out how long an object is, as long as you can find a vertex that's all the way to the furthest side of that object and just pick another one on the other furthest side. So I believe the first number we found was 10. Yep, I remembered that right. So we have 10 and 11. Those are the numbers we have to remember this time. Now it's time to map this. So we're gonna just go ahead, scale it max uniform. And now we're gonna talk about what I was mentioning earlier. You see how that max uniform didn't actually fill the square completely? It got us all the way from bottom to top, but it didn't get us all the way from right to left. So we have to compensate for that by going max horizontal too. And you'll notice it got a little bit malformed. This shape we see here in the square is not the same exactly as the shape in the 3D world, but that's okay because we're about to fix that. So we have to do this one axis at a time because the two sides are not equal in measurement. First, we're going to scale it horizontally. Now the number we got was 10. What's that divided by 2? Do I hear 5? Wonderful mathematics, everybody. You calculated that correctly. 5 by 100? 500. And that side is scaled correctly. The other side was 11. That would be 550 once you've divided that by half and multiplied it by 100. The checkers are now scaled correctly, but look at this. They're not aligned. 
Now that's the important distinction you want to make. Just because you've done this math and scaled them correctly doesn't mean you can say you're finished yet. So we actually need to align these properly too. Thankfully, there's an easy way to do that. All you have to do is just select everything here in your 2D UV mapping menu here, right click, and there's an option called move to if you're in body mode. We're gonna click that and pick center. Look at that, instantly aligned with the grid. We just UV mapped this wonky object with perfectly scaled and perfectly aligned checkers. How about that? You can follow those steps for just about any shape you can think of, and as long as you know the right numbers, as long as your math is correct, as long as you're not afraid to do a little bit of number crunching, and maybe you might want to keep a calculator handy if the numbers get too big or too crazy, you can UV map just about anything in this way. So let's try this process again on this ring-shaped platform, which we actually spawned using a cylinder that we turned into a tube. You might be familiar with that process if you watched the modeling video. Same idea. We're going to go to UV mapping, segment by projection, continue projection normal. Seriously, this just becomes like second nature. I could do this in my sleep. And that's our fill texture. Once we get it on here, let's hide the rest of this world. Combine them real quick so we can do that in one fell swoop. And now it's time for trim. Marquee this. Get a trim texture loaded up here. Scale it just a little. We're not going to scale it all the way out because we don't want it to get distorted. Then max vertical. Pretty nice trim. But now it's time for checkers. We're just going to select all these top faces, pick a checker texture, and this time we're doing it in a nice green. So let's measure this out. We're going to measure this from bottom to top with these two vertices, just like I explained. Even though this is a ring, we can do it this way. This is 12, and it should be 12 across too. Yep, 12. So. Here's an interesting little tidbit about this outliner menu and materials. So the, the material we textured this with was Chex 2, the green checker texture. If you right click that and then go to select here, you can just instantly select everything that has that texture. So if everything else in your world is hidden and you're just texturing one platform or one face, maybe you just want to give that a unique checker texture and then just do that so you can instantly select it to go back to the UV mapping. Now. It's time to do the steps. This actually has the same advantage as the perfect square, whereas uh, what I mean by that is you can just scale uniform, don't even have to do anything different. This is actually a one step transformation. So that was a 12 by 12 ring. We're gonna scale this by 600 then. If you were following along, you should already know how I got those numbers. And I think we're pretty good. We don't even have to move that to the center because it was just a scale uniform. That thing has its center just straight in the middle here, so it didn't even get misaligned. We have this nicely textured ring. Let's move on and texture some of these more complex widgets. We're going to turn our skybox off. We definitely don't need that. So just as a bit of a litmus test for this whole process, I made this thing, this sort of complex junction of platforms. And I'm going to texture that right in front of you guys, and I'm going to demonstrate every single step that I take to get to a completely textured platform. So I'm going to go ahead and just fill it in with the fill texture, explaining how the fill texture gets its name. Pretty nice fill texture job. That's the simplest part of this process. Now I'm going to select every face that needs checkers and just give them a checker texture. I'm actually going to make some of these parts different colors, just to spice it up a bit. We'll make the slope blue, and this part off here, let's make that red. This part will be green. So we have these four segments here. Wrong texture. That's the one I wanted. Now, I probably wouldn't texture it with these specific colors if I were making this an actual stage, but I think this serves to demonstrate the process pretty nicely. Now, uh, let's apply the trim first before we get ahead of ourselves. 
you can actually just select it all like this. And I'll notice that the marquee got some stuff we didn't want. We can just select that again to deselect it. And we're going to get all the sides right here. So we're going to put these all into the side texture. Now, we just want to do the stuff that's completely horizontally straight first. We're not going to pay attention to this slope because there's a separate way that we have to texture that correctly with trim because trim isn't always just simple and easy. There's some other tricks I'm about to teach you for texturing trim when that gets more complicated. So what we're gonna do is go back to UV mapping, scale all these max uniform normalized sizes, just make sure it's all the same scaling factor. Same thing we did before, just apply that trim nice and easy. Now it's time for the slope. So what you do with this slope is actually more complex. You'll notice that both of these, you can't just scale these max vertical because that doesn't get us what we want. What I'm going to do is actually first I'm going to flip this so they're both facing the same direction. You'll see how this makes it easier for us in just a little bit. Now I'm going to select both of them, scale them max uniform, and now here comes the fun part. So I'm gonna select both of these vertices, just using marquees, so I get the, the top vertices for both of these slopes. And I'm gonna move these vertically, so they're all the way up like this. Now what that lets us do is just easily select the two pairs of vertices on both of these slope platforms. Just the bottom ones with a marquee like that, top ones with a marquee like that. Now what we're about to do is we're gonna get the top ones both of these slopes should have their vertices selected now. And we are going to go to the flatten command. We're going to flatten this on the y-axis. Now we're going to do the same for these. Just marquee the bottom ones, flatten, pick y. Now you can already see that the texture is beginning to follow this slope. Now we're going to select all, just get both of these. And now we're going to scale max vertical and we're gonna stretch it out a little bit on the horizontal so that it looks pretty nice. There you go. That's how you texture a slope with trim. And trim can get even more complex than that, but that process can handle just most jobs that you're gonna have with texturing trim. So I'll show you some more extreme examples of that in just a bit. Now it's time to texture the rest of these checkers. I'm gonna do this just piece by piece. Let's see. This is the furthest left we can go from this side. Uh, we're gonna go from there to there, and we can see that in the X direction, actually it's the Z direction we're trying to find here. In the Z direction, this is five. In the X direction, this is six. So this is a five by six dog leg, sorta. I guess that's what you'd call this shape. Max vertical to compensate because it didn't scale all the way. And now we're going to scale this 300 horizontally for that 600 and 250 vertically for that 500. And here I think I'm going to do it. Nope, actually, this actually scaled correctly. What I was worried was going to happen was that the center would be in a weird place and it might not actually uh, align properly. And if that ever happens, what you want to do is instead of just going move to center, you can go move to and pick bottom, and then you can move to left or right, whichever one you want to pick. That should set you uh, into the right place if it's ever just not working out for you to just do center. We can do this whole segment next. We can treat this as just one whole segment. In fact, if I had not been stupid enough to texture this with a different texture than this, I could have done all that in one fell swoop. Just be on the lookout for how you can do this process most efficiently. So let's see. On the x-axis, this is 7 long. On the z-axis, this is 5. So this is a 7 by 5 platform. Let's do the thing. Max uniform. Max vertical. Half of 7 would be 350 and half of 5 would be 250. Move to center. Looking nice. We're gonna do this next because it's the last flat platform. This is 4.
by 4. Pretty easy there. We can actually probably just do a uniform scale to get that right. 200. And we're going to move it to the center just in case, but it already was in the center. You can never be too careful. Now it's time for this slope. And here's where things might get a little hairier. Um, this slope might be okay. I think it depends on the slope. Like if you have a really steep one or a really long one, sometimes that projection normal can just get it completely wrong. And uh, this isn't the case this time, it looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I did this before I measured, silly goose. So docking this here, we're gonna measure this out. And here you actually have to take the Y into account. Well, I guess in this case you don't. It's actually still just X and Y. But if we can just get this diagonal here, this is actually going to measure both of the links for us. 2 by 6. Just because this goes in a perfect diagonal from the top left edge here to the bottom right edge. So, we're about to texture this 2 by 6. And it's already 2 actually, because the max horizontal scaling already set that to a perfect 2. So, we're good to go with that slope. We have this whole segment pretty nicely textured. How's that looking? So it's time for one last lesson about trim. We can actually use that same method we used to texture the slope to texture crazy surfaces like this with trim. So, I've actually already taken the liberty of doing the checkers correctly on these wavy slopes here. If you were paying attention before, you should already know how that's done. So I'm not going to bore you with it. one more checker texturing explanation. That's actually just as easy as it always was. The real star of the show for these platforms here is going to be the trim. And I'm going to show you why. So I'm going to go ahead and select all of these bits to get the trim texture on them. I'm going to set these to the trim texture. And now we go to UV mapping. And you see this puts it into four distinct parts. So these two right here, these uh, little rectangles, those aren't going to give us much trouble at all. We can actually just go ahead and do them. Uh, it's just a simple max vertical. That actually looks fine as it is. So those can be out of sight, out of mind as far as I care. What we want to focus on is these. These are going to be a little bit trickier. But you can actually use that process from before to get them right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start selecting these top lines with marquees just so I get them both. Keep in mind there's another behind the one that I'm selecting here. So I'm going to get all of these and then I'm going to move this vertically. Now this is temporary because it's way distorted right now but this is for that same simple purpose of just getting all of these top vertices with a marquee so we can flatten them and we're going to flatten them vertically. We're going to do the same thing with this bottom face. Flatten Y. Both of these have been flattened now. Now what we're going to do is just scale them max vertical, just like the slope before. And we're going to scale max horizontal, bring it out a little bit. Now we can admire our handiwork, and like magic, the trim is following this curve. Even if it's an even stranger curve like this one that's just going both directions, you can actually do the whole thing the same way. Let's hide this one because we want to work with this one. Here's a little trick for selecting a bunch of faces. If there are a bunch that are similar, you can just hit the I key and Wings will select anything that has the same surface area. So we're not even going to bother texturing these. Let's just pretend that these are covered up by a platform. They're boring anyhow. No one's going to see them. We want to texture these because that's fun. So we're going to put the trim texture on. Here it is down here going to UV mapping, and here's where we're going to flip this one, just so we can easily select them both. To make sure they're overlapping perfectly, we can actually move them both to the center, although that wasn't necessary in this case. Maybe you'll find that you have to do that eventually on your own. Same process, we're just going to go and select all of these. Just get them all, and you know, that's taking a little bit too much time. Maybe I don't want to do that. Instead, I can just start selecting these and hitting the I key, and it's going to select everything in this world that's similar to that. So you can instantly get all of these little connector segments here. That took a lot less time, didn't it? 
Now what we can do is scale all of these vertically. Oh, it looks like it missed one, just down here somewhere. I'm gonna do a quick marquee to get that, and then deselect all that. Ah, we have to do it over. Lame. It missed one somewhere. How did it miss one? Anyway, let's try this again. Yep, that's looking better. We're gonna scale this way up so we can get all these vertices up here. We're gonna flatten them. Why? Flatten these too. Now we can give this a nice max vertical scaling. And just for fine tuning, we can max horizontal in body mode, because you have to be in body mode to get those max commands. And we're gonna push this back out to about here. And you can see that we now have trim following all the way along this edge. This works in just about any situation, so have fun messing around with this. Hopefully you can make some pretty cool trim. So I'm actually gonna show off one last method of doing this uh, trim following the geometry trick. And this might actually be the easiest way to make it happen. So if you're in a situation where you can actually modify the 3D geometry just for a temporary sort of setup, this is probably the way that you might wanna make this happen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of these top faces just dragging along nice and slow so they all get selected. I didn't texture these with checkers because I don't think it's necessary this time. In a real world situation, I probably would have, but you don't need to see me texture anything more with checkers, I think. This is about the trim. Now what we're gonna actually do here is we're gonna move this face vertically, just a nice stretch in the Y direction so we can temporarily have something that we can work with a lot easier. And we moved this five meters up and we can remember that number so we can put it back when we're done with it. So that's gonna make it way easier to select all of these faces that we're gonna put trim on. We're actually not gonna put trim on these faces because that's way simpler. And we just wanna demonstrate these. And this, I believe, should actually lead into a situation where I can tell you about the difference between left-clicking and right-clicking this UV mapping option here. So if we left-click, you can see that the changes we made in the 3D environment didn't take in the UV mapping environments. This is still UV mapped as if it were the thinner platform that we started with. So to make this work the way we want it to, we have to right-click this instead. So we're starting over with this UV mapping. Now it's the same process that we're gonna do, segment by projection, and continue with the projection normal. There, that's how it actually looks. Just remember, every time you do that right-click on the UV mapping, that's gonna just reset everything and remap the UVs so that they're how they actually are in the 3D world. Like if you've made any changes between the last time you UV mapped and you wanna make some new changes now in the UV mapping, just start over with a right click to that option. We're gonna scale these a little bit and now comes that vital step of flipping this one. And just because I like to keep things orderly, I'm gonna move these both to the center. Now what we're gonna do, we don't even have to scale or adjust anything. We're instantly in a situation where we can just select all these vertices and flatten them. We made it way easier for ourselves this way. You should know these steps by heart already now. I'm gonna scale this to max vertical, maybe push this out a little bit on the horizontal. And now we're going to apply the trim texture. Now this is way distorted, but we're gonna put it back the way it was. So we're gonna select all these top faces again, and we're gonna put them back down the five meters that we stretched them out. And now we have a nice trim texture that follows these curves. Probably the easiest and most convenient way to do it if you don't mind getting your hands a little dirty, modifying some 3D geometry just for a little temporary setup. So there's one last thing that I want to mention here, and after all that advanced stuff, this is going to seem so insignificant, but every now and then you're going to run into a various uh, kind of problem with texturing once you get these checkers aligned properly. And that's that sometimes after you do all your scaling and all your aligning, they don't come out actually uh, pressed up next to each other in the right way. You'll see how instead of a dark checker going right into a light checker, you end up with two dark checkers 
just kind of smudging up against each other here and two light checkers. Like, see how this is so jarring? That's not right, but there's a very simple way to fix that. All you have to do is just select all the faces that are misaligned. You're gonna go to your UV mapping, just left click it, because you don't have to change any of the geometry. And now all that you're gonna do is just go to move and pick any direction. It can be vertical or horizontal. All you have to do is just move this one increment of 0.25. And you might remember that I have that set to an alt constraint key. So when I just hold the alt key, it just moves it 0.25. That's why it's so useful. This is where I probably use that constraint key the most. That fixed it instantly. All you have to do is just make one small movement and that annoying problem will bother you no longer. So just keep a lookout for anything in your stage texturing that has this issue. Don't let it crop up on you and just be familiar with how you fix it. Also, I've noticed in a lot of my stages while I'm building it, uh, that kind of issue can just have this sort of ripple effect where like one misaligned thing can suddenly just create these massive cascades, giant chains of platforms where all the checkers are misaligned and you just have to fix them one by one. So try and catch this error as quickly as you can, otherwise it'll come and bite you in the butt. So now with all of these different pieces that we have individually UV mapped to perfection, we have actually cobbled together some semblance of a stage. I mean, as far as stage design goes, this kind of looks like it was made by a blind wombat, but hey, all the checkers are aligned pretty nicely, so give old batty some credit, I say. Let's just combine all this together, because there's one last thing I want to mention before we call this a day. So I know I talked about this a little bit earlier, and that thing is auto-smoothing. So auto-smoothing is kind of a crucial final step for any stage, just to make sure it renders correctly. Because remember that smooth shading that we talked about in the last video? If we turn on smooth shading right now, we're gonna get some disgusting sights. I mean, look at this platform. Look at those shadows. What are those shadows? We're gonna fix this. And the way you fix it, it's simple as this. So, out of smooth shading for a second while we do this, just so I can show you what this looks like when it's done properly. So we're gonna go down here in body mode, just a right click in the void will take you to this auto smooth function in the menu here. And if you just left click that auto smooth, it does it for you, but it doesn't always do it right. There are some segments here that it didn't get because it uses a certain kind of factor to determine which which faces are gonna end up, or which, which edges rather, are gonna end up being hard. So um, if you go to auto smooth here and right click it, you can actually change the crease angle to something smaller or larger if you want it to be a smoother or a coarser operation. So I'm gonna put this at 20, and that's probably gonna cover us. Actually, it didn't, because if it were my own judgment that I were passing here on this stage, I would say these two lines here need to be hardened. Otherwise, it's gonna still kind of look smooth going over this obviously kind of angular slope. So the way you do this manually is after you select both of those edges, you right click and you go down to hardness here in your menu and you can set that manually to hard. Let's do it on the bottom of the stage too, just because we care. I accidentally clicked soft that first time. That was not what I wanted. But as you can see, everything else looks just about right. If you get kind of angular edges like this, you want to make sure that all of these edges are hard. And if you have something that's smoother, like this, you want to make sure that the edges are soft. So you want to take a look at edges like this. So if any of these were hard, let me show you what this would look like. I'm going to separate this and just put some auto smooth on this platform with a ridiculously low crease angle, like one. If you put that to one, it's just gonna make every edge hard, no matter what. So it made all of these hard. Now if you go to smooth shading and you look closely, it's actually pretty hard to see, but every one of those is gonna be kind of individually shaded and that's not what you want. You want this to actually look like this. In game, that would have been way more apparent. I can promise you that. 
So we're going to combine all this again. Now that we have a nicely auto smoothed model, it's time to sit back. We're going to turn off these axes and grid, put it into perspective mode, and now we can finally toggle smooth shading and admire what we've done. So this would be a nice kind of screenshot of this stage, I think. If you just finished this and you want to show it off, you could screenshot it like this. This is about how it would look in-game. So if we imported this, this is what it would be. Our final product after a long process of UV mapping. Hopefully all that helped you out when it comes to this process. Hopefully it can help you create some stages that look better. And the one thing to remember is just make sure you always stick to the grid because otherwise this whole process is not going to be possible. Vanilla stages have a lot of attention to detail, and if you want to match that attention to detail, you just have to be vigilant about a lot of different things. And uh, if you do it right, though, the results can be just so good. Like, this stage looks pretty awesome, I think. For a blind wombat's design, anyhow. So, this has been Pseudonymous BN. I'm going to be coming back to you in the next episode with an explanation of one last feature that this program has, and that is the Bend tool. That's actually a tool that I did not cover in my first video when I was discussing other tools and features in this program, because the Bend tool is kind of its own beast. You kind of have to think of it differently than most of the rest of the program, but the things you can accomplish if you know how to use the Bend tool are just mind-blowing. So it's going to be a super advanced sort of topic to cover, and I hope you're ready for it because it'll be coming to you soon. Signing out.